Good morning. Good morning, good morning. What a lovely day. 14 degrees or something, 15 degrees in February. I'm having so much trouble getting my hedges cut. You just can't, cannot get anybody to do anything in this country. Everybody is just so unreliable. I've had tyres in. I've had... I want to refit one of the rooms at work to turn it into a small dental lab. I've had kitchen fitters in who said they could come back and give me a quote and don't. I need a wall built at home. I've had a Ricky's say they'll come round and give me a quote. They never turn up. The one of my favourite sayings, because it's one of my sayings, invented by me, is that in order to be good in this country, you just have to merely be not shit. Because that's what you're competing with for the most part. You're competing with some real, you know, to find anyone who can get anything organised in any sort of reasonable way, let alone any sort of good way. It's very, it's impossible. And I think it's getting worse. You know, if you spend 20 minutes on the phone as I did yesterday to uh, my local Boots Pharmacy, just didn't pick up. Not even, a, not even a message, not even a message saying, I'm sorry we can't take your call at the moment, um, but we can't take a message, but please do bring back later. Not even that, you know, not even a 30 pound answer phone. And then, and that includes their customer services uh, in Nottingham. You know, the main line, you know, please press blah, 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 one, two, three, four, and you press four, and then you get through, and they say, okay, now you press four, now you've got to go through another five options, press blah, 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 so you press, and then nothing. No, just a ringtone, you know? And uh, uh, Sainsbury's Pharmacy, try and, you know, ring up, see if they've got a drug in stock that, you know, for a child who's got really bad pain. Uh, nothing, just uh, dark, you know, rings out. You know, just no, nothing. No, not even a thirty-pound answer phone on the Sainsbury's Pharmacy, which is Lloyd's Pharmacy, basically. It's Lloyd's, you know. Say Sainsbury's subcontract all their stuff now, don't they? Makes a change from the old days when they all thought, when they deregulated bodies corporate, and they thought that they, all these big guys thought that they could get into dentistry and run dentistry better than the dentists. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. How did that work out for you? Anyway. This is my... Uh, I wonder what to talk about today. And um, You know, I mean, I know I am a little bit repetitious. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's usually something new that happens that you can talk about. Yesterday you had a lady come in who hadn't been in for five years. And she's she's a funny lady, you know. She's got, sometimes, my, my sense of humour can be quite blunt, you know. Uh, I mean, it is blunt. And it, and it, do you know what, it's deliberately blunt. It's blunt to the point where if somebody went to the GDC and said, do you know, the, my dentist said this to me, the GDC would say, oh, we can't believe it, we're shocked. We are shocked. Right, and that's the whole point of my humour is to be shocking, uh, and and not to be offensive, or to bring the profession into disrepute. But sometimes just to get people out of their uh, comfort zone in terms of what it's it's like to visit a dentist. You know, just to to, to just to emphasise that they've come somewhere slightly different, a little bit. Uh, it works a little bit different for, from, from the other dentists that they've ever been to. and Because usually those dentists are the ones where they've had problems. You know, and so... Um, uh, so another um, part of this jigsaw is how I initially consult with the patients. And I do it by uh, sitting them down at a desk. They don't, they don't come straight from the waiting room into the chair. Uh, they, you know... That's a bit like <laughs> that's a bit like uh, you know arresting someone and then interviewing them sitting on the old the old uh, scaffold. You know the guillotine 
<laughs> you, I so said we sit down at a table, and I've always, where it's been possible, I've always tried to do this. Uh, in my um, old surgery, it was a reasonably large room, and we had like a settee in the corner, and um, uh, and then and then the chair, and then in the other corner was a desk. And when the patients came in, I used to be sitting at the desk. And they used to say, shall I get in the chair? And I said, no, no, have a seat, let's have a chat, you know? And you get far more out of people sitting on a sofa than you do sitting in a chair, you know? Uh, they're pretty much expecting to just lie back and open their mouth by the time they're in the chair. And I think they like to think that they've sort of agreed, you know, we've agreed on an agenda by the time they get into the chair. Uh, so they're a lot happier to get in because they pretty well know in advance what's going to happen uh, rather than it ending up as a surprise, you know? But, um, yeah, so, um, so this woman came in and, uh, basically, she was pretty depressed and, you know, which is not, uh, at all unusual. You can, uh, oh, it's closed, isn't it? You know, you, you know, you see that all of life, don't you? All of life is here in the dental practice, uh, and you get the people who are hyper and the bloody nymphomaniacs and the uh, children and the uh, people who've, you know, had got a cancer diagnosis and have to tell you they're in the middle of chemo and all sorts of stuff. So, so you're dealing with life in the raw, really. And she was just depressed because she was going over for, you know, to have a test for um, dementia, senile dementia, I presume. And you don't get tested for that unless you, the people around you are complaining that you're uh, acting weirdly, you know, and your your memories, uh, you know, you, you get up and and you keep going up and downstairs. You can't remember why you're doing it, etc., etc. So she's pretty depressed because, you know, that's a one-way ticket for the most part. It's not a good test to have, let alone a diagnosis. But anyway, she hadn't had the diagnosis and even had the test, but she was obviously a bit down about it. And I just finished opening the post. And uh, on the uh, on the desk in front of me was my mobile phone and the mouse and, and the pair of scissors that I've been using to open the post. And um, you know, and I went for a medical history and everything. And she said, you know, I've been I'm waiting for this test for dementia. And I said, oh. And she told me about the problems with her teeth. And I said, well, you know, um, I'm sure we'll come up with a solution. And I said, uh, and if we don't, uh, if we can't come up with a solution to your problems, I, I said, there's a pair, of, a pair of scissors, you can cut your wrists. And and they sort of look at you for a second as if to say, did I hear that correctly? You know, my dentist just invited me to cut my wrists if I wasn't happy with his diagnosis. And then they sort of, they, and it just sort of snaps them out of it, you know, it just snaps them out of it. And, uh, and you know, after a while, they really laugh because it's that it's a tension laugh. You know, they, it breaks the tension. Anyway, she went in the surgery, and I had a look round, and uh, I told her that uh, you know her teeth are in a pretty bad way, and we probably need to take quite a few of them out. Uh, and I said, but, but the good news is that um, if it turns out you do have dementia, um, you'll never remember you had any. So, now, it's, I, to come up with a joke like that on the spot is not. It's not easy, do you know what I mean? It's like, and the trouble with jokes like that is that you have to you have to do them. You have to do them. They don't work a second late. They don't work half a second late, those jokes. You just have to come straight out with them and just trust <coughs> that the patient's gonna realize, as it's got a sense of humor. It has to be judged, you know, you have to, there's no point doing it on someone that's crying because they've just lost their husband or crying because they've just lost their son in a car crash. That's not called for at that point. That that patient wants sympathy and empathy, but um, you know, but someone who perhaps is feeling a bit sorry for themselves or is a bit nervous or whatever, or, you know, you can sometimes you can sort of snap them into a much better place by just by by saying something that's um, totally out of their comfort zone. Anyway, um, anyway, <laughs> I think having believed that I couldn't. She couldn't believe that I'd already made a joke about her possibly cutting her wrists if she didn't like the diagnosis. She then couldn't believe that I made a further joke about her uh, not to worry because um, should she uh, lose all her teeth, uh, the the dementia would mean that she uh, wouldn't really worry about it, you know, that because she'd never remember that she had them in the first place. <coughs> so again, we had a big laugh, but 
I have <clears throat> appeared in front of the GDC most recently as a, as a witness uh, and <clears throat> I, I shudder to think how that would have gone down in front of the GDC, you know, the most anal of analysed institutions uh, uh, where you are literally presumed guilty until you are proven slightly less guilty, which is basically their, uh, you know, their attitude. Um, what would they think about, you know, a patient who said, Mr. Watson told me if I didn't like his diagnosis, I could cut my wrists. And uh, Mr. Watson said that uh, uh, if all my teeth fell out, it wouldn't matter because I've got Alzheimer's. You know, that's, I'd be off the register for those two jokes alone. I um, would. I'm not kidding. That's, that's just the way it is. So <clears throat> let me warn you, if you're going to try that sort of thing, I would wait until you're quite an old, experienced practitioner just so that you can judge it. Not because don't, you, won't, you won't get thrown off the register if you're old. In fact, at my, my stage of my career, they're more than happy to chuck me off the register. They're a dentist with 40 years' experience and, uh, uh, you know, and a wealth of, uh, uh, a wealth of uh, technical experience and uh, pra uh, patient experience. To, to share with treatment planning experience etc all that built up over my, my pretty well blameless faultless career uh, but they always just say oh uh, you know this dentist he's, uh, he's 61 he's, he's you know he's, he's sort of 35 years out of dental school so he obviously you know he's probably forgotten everything about dentistry and he's just sitting there enjoying sitting back on his fat dumb and happy on his GDC registration, um, doing what the hell he likes and making a ton of money and um, and uh, bringing the uh, profession down and bringing the profession into disrepute, uh, you know, because he can't be asked. And that's, that is just their starting point, you know, that's where they start from. So they're far more likely to, uh, uh, let's say, strike off a 60-year-old who's made a tasteless joke than they are to strike off a 25 year old who's broken someone's jaw. Because, uh, you know, by taking on a, an extraction that they should ne never have touched. The, because they'll, they'll assume, they'll say, oh, the 25 year old, he's only just out of dental school. He's obviously extremely highly trained. And, uh, and uh, that was just bad luck, you know. It was unfortunate that that happened. Uh, but, but the older practitioners, uh, you know, they're like, they really want us off the register. You know, they, they want to get us off the register. They feel that uh, the culling, culling uh, the, 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 the sort of the more senior practitioners raises the standards generally. That's, the, that's their sort of way of thinking. Anyway, uh, had, so, so I sit down and uh, have a chat with this woman who, who starts off by saying that she wants to make a claim on her insurance for the dental treatment she had done five years ago. And she's brought a ton of forms in, and please could I fill them in? So, which includes me writing down what treatment she had, and how much she paid for it, and how many courses, and there's a new form for every course, blah, 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 and, you know. So anyway, this is just, uh, this is just part of what you do for nothing, basically. You know, you, you just have to grit your teeth and, and do this. Uh, even though, you know, if it's a checkup or something, Probably all the profit that you might have made for the, in, in the checkup uh, is going to get sucked up by the fact that you have to do all their admin and all their paperwork. So um, anyway, she's come in because one of her front, front crowns has fallen off, and uh, she's got a lot of decay in another tooth. Can I? Well, she's not been in for five years, and she's one of these people that spends a lot of time abroad. Possibly got a holiday house in Spain and stuff like that. Only tends to come in when she's got. Um, uh, um, problems, you know, as in, as in as in now. So, and certainly there's so much decay in the canine. I can't believe she's been in or seen anyone in the last five years because um, there's no they, they they wouldn't have missed that, you know. I mean that's been festering away for five years, pretty much. This canine's pretty well rotten all the way through. So she's like. Uh, uh, you know, I want to. I can't walk around like this, obviously. So I said, oh, it might be as simple as just taking a, a mould, you know, making a new crown. Have you got the bits? No. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so.
So, so we look at it and um, it's all uh, okay. I mean, sure enough, the pan has broken. God knows why, but uh, possibly because it was porcelain. It was a PJC or something. And um, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to race up to these green lights. I'm not. I am not. I'm early. I'm actually. Oh no, I'm early. I'm not early. Yes, I am early. I'm all right. I'm on time. I'm fine. So anyway. <laughs> She's like, um, so I looked at it and the preparation was um, where, where her gums used to be when the crown was originally made. So it's about two millimetres down from where it needs to be. So it's obviously that I can't, I can't just take an impression. I've got to do some preparation of the tooth. Uh, and we've got to take x-rays of the tooth and possibly vitality testing. And then there's the case of this highly uh, decayed canine, which is uh, unlikely to be root treated and um, quite possibly cariously exposed by the time we take all the caries out of it which means it's going to need a root treatment and then uh, you know a brave person might put a big white filling in it but a sensible person would probably put a post supported crown in it so she's looking at I mean, my prices are cheap she's looking about 366 for the root filling and about another I don't know five six hundred seven hundred fifty say for the for the post crown so so um it's just me um you know, how much will the crown be? I said, oh, I don't know, uh, there's 567 hour crowns off. It's all online, you can look it up. And uh, and she's like, and she looks at me and her face, <laughs> her jaw hit the floor. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, and I don't often say this, but I said to her, how much did you expect it to be? You know, I said, we're, we're not especially expensive in terms of private work, but you're obviously shocked. She And she was obviously shocked. Now, you have to be careful because, you know, if you, if you study Richard Denny and all the salespeople and they say to you, like, it doesn't matter what the price is, what price you're quoted, you always go, you always go, oh my God, you're joking. Are you, you're joking. Are you right? Have you got the decimal place wrong there? You see, because that's a sales, that's a, <coughs> that's a sales and purchase technique. When you're, uh, you've got a lot of, um, uh, got a lot of a good advice on selling uh, Rob Richard Denny and um, and a bit of advice on how to overcome uh, sales pitches and uh, one of them with regards to negotiating on price and we don't do it at all in this country but is to say um, uh, you know just have to say that I wasn't expecting to pay that much or that seems a lot or or, or, or the, the best way to do it is to go oh my god oh my god you know, and what happens is the person who's quoted the price then starts feeling guilty and thinking, "Oh my God, you know, what have I done? I've really upset this woman. I better bring the price down a bit to cheer her up a bit." You know, <laughs> but she was genuinely. So I said to her, "How much do you think it should be?" And she said, "Well, I was thinking uh, around about a <laughs> hundred." So I'm like, I did four crowns. I remember there was the first four private crowns I ever did in 1982, 1983 and they were 2112 and I charged £400 for them because it, I remember it well because it was four teeth, it was 400 quid and I remember it very well because I wasn't at all good at selling private private dentistry and uh, and in those days we used to do crowns on the National Health Service so I said to him, look, you can get four NHS crowns, I said, and that, but there'll be um, uh, adequate, you know, they'll be of a reasonable, they'll be merchantable quality, but the porcelain is going to look a bit like Armitage Shanks type porcelain. Or I said, if you know, if we can, we can spend more time and use better quality materials and use a better quality lab if we go private. But uh, four front crowns would be about uh, would be four hundred pounds. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of money. And I said, and most people don't have that sort of money available. So there, I was trying to talk the bloke into, oh, at least offering him, at least offering him the private alternative, um, which is a whole other story. You know, you won't get any private work if you never offer it. Um, and I remember he looked at me like I was slightly mad. And I thought, what's going through his head? Because he was, he gave me this funny look. And then he said to me, uh, <clears throat> What would you say if it turned out that the money was available? So I'm like, 
And at that point, my <clears throat> I looked at him differently because I just he was just a young bloke, and um, I forget why he needed the pounds. I think uh, they possibly been at work and a bit of wood had come off a lathe and, and broken all his front teeth or something. But um, so I was I was rebuilding them all. Those were in the old days when when you could get you know really really top quality work done on the NHS. And um, and and I was like, oh well, you know, if if the money is available, then obviously, you know, I suggest you're doing privately. He said, well, well, let's do it privately. So, and he was like, <clears throat> he must have gone home and said to his wife, I went to the dentist and, you know, it was all I could do to bloody well scrape a, scrape a quote out of him for any sort of decent work. And then he, he, he promptly steered me away from it and said that, I, you know, it was probably unaffordable. <laughs> <laughs> you think this bloke doesn't want to do any private work the amount of obstacles he puts in your way to get out I had to practically beg him to do them for me privately <coughs> so that's how I remember in 1983 crowns were £100 each because of that story four crowns £400 private so <clears throat> anyway I said to this woman the last time crowns were £100 was 1983 you know I don't know I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, but I said, I, what I'll do, and what we're doing, and it's the best way to do it, I said to her, look, I'll type this all up, I'll write it all down, you don't have to remember anything, I'll um, send it all, I'll email it through to you today, and then you can uh, you can get back to me and check your insurance and see what you're going to do, you know. She had this insurance, it's £8 a month or something, and pays up to £200 a course of treatment. So it's obviously very, very basic. And she'd chosen that because she didn't want to pay for the, the £25 a month one that covered up to £1,000 worth of course, of course of work treatment or something. So, you know, it, just, it annoys me because we do a, a £30 a month one, which pretty much covers the, the whole cost of any treatment that you need with no limits. Uh, although you do have to pay things like lab bills. Uh, so I think, you know, she'd been paying this for five years, although it's only £96 a year, so, so she literally paid 500 quid and uh, was, was mortified. So she's, she's still living in 1983, unfortunately. But what do you do? So what I did was I just um, typed it all in and uh, emailed it through to her, and we'll have to wait and see what she says. I don't know what she's going to do. But, you know, that's it. You, you just give people a quote, and then you have to, as Kevin Lewis says, he said, don't quote, don't talk about money in the surgery. He says... Uh, send it in a letter let them have their embarrassment in private he said if they're financially embarrassed he said let them be embarrassed in private and I think that's probably the best way to do it you know and even now when people say to me uh, how much is X, Y and Z I'm very reluctant to say anything anything uh, you know I won't I won't because let's say someone says to me how much is a crown and I think, oh, I'm going to say, I don't know, 500, 600 quid or something. They will keep, they, they will stick to that, you know. Whatever you say, that figure, if it's a pound more, you're setting the absolute top level at that point of you do the quote. You're absolutely setting the absolute maximum that you can charge them. And and the worst case is a bridge, like, for example, where you say, oh, a bridge is about 1,200 quid. And then you type in the type of bridge they need, and it's about 1,900 quid. And then, you know, then, then that's a problem, isn't it? Because you've told them it's 1,200, and then, then you tell them it's 1,900, and it's, you know, it just goes wrong. So I just say, look, I don't, I don't remember any of the fees. I just type it all in the computer. Computer prints it all out. Computer will tell you, tell you where everything is cost, you know, and then uh, it's, um, I think that's the best way to do it. Just to, just, uh, and, and have a decent computer system where it doesn't take you, like, only five or 10 minutes just to do a 12-page quote which is what mine, mine is, and um, and then uh, and then uh, bang it off, you know, make sure they get it the same day, and then some you win and some you lose. Anyway, all right, nice to talk to you. I'll uh, talk to you tomorrow. Bye.